All right, amen. Second Samuel chapter number 13. So again, this is three weeks in a row of hard truths that you definitely aren't going to get in your Sunday school, right? <laughs> so we talked about, you know, in chapter 11, what do we see? Well, we saw a man after God's own heart fall in, a, in just a horrible way. I mean, adultery, murder, conspiracy, all of those things. And then last week, you know, if you're not a new evangelical, you got the real story about what, San, or, I'm sorry, what uh, King David did when uh, it was time for him to go finish the job in Rabbah of the children of Ammon, what did he do? He put the people under saws. And we said, you know, what the NIV and the ESV say is that, oh, well, he set up Job Corps and he set up, the, you know, uh, he employed the people and he basically gave them jobs and just put them to work, right? And we proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that's wrong, okay? He actually cut the people. That's what he did. And so after that, what do we see? Verse number one it says this, and it came to pass after this. So after the war is over, after they come back from the children of Ammon, it says, and it came to pass after this, that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Okay, and so this is the narrator telling us this here. At this moment in time, he loves her. Well, he should because it's his sister, but this is uh, definitely not a good kind of love. This is, this is going to progress into lust, and that's what the title of the sermon is this evening. It's Drunk on Lust, and we'll get into that here in a moment. So verse 2, it says, And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. This is very important to understand here because there's going to be a shift in the way that he thinks and in his actions based solely off of a person here. So take a look at that. Look at verse number three. It says this, but Amnon had a friend. And I've heard a lot of sermons, you know, but Amnon had a friend. <laughs> and it's because it's true, you know. Amnon considers this guy a friend, but as you've learned uh, throughout the past several weeks, it's definitely not a biblical type friend. But it says that Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother in Jonadab was a very subtle man, okay? That's in there for a reason. I know Bible commentators and stuff like that, they, they wanna just brush past that, say, oh, you know, that, that type of stuff doesn't really matter, but that is very important, especially towards the end of the sermon, you'll see why that's very important. But look at verse number four. It says, and he said unto him, why art thou being the king's son lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother, Absalom's sister. And we talked about this this morning. You know, there, there are some things, well, First of all, if you have this issue, you shouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> you get some serious help. But Jonadab was definitely the wrong guy to tell his feelings to. Okay? It, this, is, this is terrible because what does the Bible say that Jonadab is? He's subtle. Right? He's subtle. So obviously Amnon's vexed. He's, he's, you know, he's displaying signs. He's displaying symptoms in his life. He's got problems. He's definitely got some issues here. But a subtle guy like Jonadab, he starts to get curious. He starts to get inquisitive. And he's like, wait a second here. What's going on with you, man? Can't you just tell me? So what does he do? Spills the beans. Okay, obviously have, has approved this guy. Wisdom is out the window here. And you say, okay, great. What's the big deal here? What does it mean to be uh, subtle? Well, a subtle person, somebody who's elusive, craft, you know, crafty, uh, cunning, just basically skilled. Now, obviously, if you're on our side and you got subtlety, right? You're a good, you know, you're good to go. You're, you're born again. You know, you're so many. It can be good to be subtle when you're going to these apartment complexes, you know, and going into some of these trailer parks that try to keep us out, right? That kind of subtlety is good. This, no, not good. Not at all. But notice Notice what happens next here after he tells Jonadab how he feels, okay? Notice that the Bible just cuts it off right there. He just spills it out there and he's looking at the guy. Look at verse 5. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat it at her hand. Well, hold on for a second. Wait a minute here. Did Amnon ask his opinion? Did he say, I've got this problem, what should I do? No, Jonadab just instantly, okay, here's what you're going to do. Yeah. Right, he offers that advice, this wicked counsel. And it's like, wait a second here. This is important for us to understand here. When you tell somebody something, they just instantly, you know, want to give you the solution. It's not always bad, but in this situation here, it's terrible. This is a terrible thing, which is why I said this morning, you know, you want to be careful who you tell things to because Jonadab is not a biblical friend, right? A friend loveth at all times. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? Well, that, this is a different kind of wound here. This is a wicked wound that Jonadab is doing, and you'll see why here. So, you know the story here. We just read it. Amnon takes this advice. Look at verse 6. It says, 
So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. And you know, I'll just stop right there for a second. I always talk about loyalty. Loyalty is a big, a big thing because it's such a problem today in society. You know, it is hard to find loyal people, but we ought not to be loyal at the expense of a relationship, loyal to a fault, right? You can take that too far to one extreme here, and that's exactly what Jonah Dab is doing. You know, he's like, yeah, I'm loyal. You're my friend. I'm going to tell you exactly how to get her. You want her, you can have her, okay? Definitely a big problem. Look at verse number seven. So it says, then David sent home to Tamar saying, go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. Right? And so she doesn't know what's going on. She's got no idea here. She's just being obedient to her father. And David believes Amnon. Okay, you're sick. No problem, man. I'll take you, uh, we'll, we'll get you taken care of. Verse number eight. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house and he was laid down. And she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. Now look at this in verse nine. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, have all men out. I'm sorry, have out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. So think about what Jonadab is telling Amnon here. He says, okay, hey, look, you're going to make yourself sick when your dad comes to see you, right? Tell him you want Tamar to come in and make you some food. That's like pouring kerosene on a fire. Okay, that's like pouring kerosene on a magnesium fire. I mean, this is a big, big problem here because what is he doing? He's setting up a situation here for Amnon to see the woman who he's, says he loves, thinks he loves, but really just lusts after, right? Doing things in a caring fashion. So he's there laying in bed, watching her care for him. And that's going to set him over the edge. So do you see how wicked Jonadab's advice is? It's not like, oh, you know, this is just kind of, no, this is, this is extremely cunning. This is extremely subtle, extremely wicked. I mean, it's like, you know, somebody telling you they struggle with alcohol or they struggle with drugs. And you're like, all right, here's what you're going to do. You're just going to bury your head in a bag of Coke, you know, or something like that. You know, I mean, that's pretty much what Jonadab did. He basically set this up to get Amnon over the edge. Look at verse number 10. Well, let me back up here to verse number nine. You know, and obviously what's the application from verse number nine? Have all men out for me. Obviously, you don't ever want to put yourself in a situation with your, where you're alone with somebody from the opposite sex. Okay, definitely not a good idea. Look at verse number 10. It says, And Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber that I might eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon her brother. And again, you're, I mean, this is just too much for him. He's got this issue with her and Jonadab's like, oh yeah, just go and have her come in and make you food. And the whole time he's just watching this and it's just fueling him up. It's just filling up the lust of the flesh. Okay. Now he's just filled to the max. He's got that curiosity thing going on here. His emotions are all over the place. He's literally vexed. He is literally in bondage here. And look what he says here in verse number 11. And when she had brought them out, oh, I'm sorry. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, come lie with me, my sister. Now, obviously this is just, I mean, just unthinkable. Okay. Amnon is her half brother. Doesn't make it half the sin. Okay. This is disgusting. This is incest. This is just, just. I mean, it's, it's unfathomable, but you know what this proves? And a lot of people want to shy away from this type of stuff here, but this is the word of God. This is the Bible. This proves that God wrote the Bible, that God preserved the Bible for us. Okay. Because if man wrote it, if people of 2021 wrote it, like they're trying to do today, right? Guess what? They would edit this out. They don't want that in there because this makes humanity look bad. This makes man look bad. So again, God's like, no, this is what people are capable of. And here's a situation. These types of things happen all the time. We need to understand that. But the good news is by studying this, like I said this morning, again, where there's sickness, there's symptoms, and where there are symptoms, there are signs, okay? Look at verse number 12. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. You know, it's crazy that she can actually appeal in this way, first of all, because she says, you know, nothing like this should ever be done in Israel, in our nation. Well, you know, when this type of thing's kind of happening today, what do people say? Oh, come on, man. I saw it on Seinfeld. You know, this is, this is great. You know, this is, this, this is our culture. Nobody, it's old fashioned to wait till you get married. Isn't that what people say today? That's old fashioned. We don't need that. But she's like, hey, look, in our nation today, I mean, we're both going to be looked down upon heavily. 
Nothing like this should be done. You know, could you imagine saying that today in America? Nothing like this ought to be done in America. Now we say that when we're <laughs> quoting the word of God, but if you were in this situation, people would be like, what? What are you talking about? This stuff happens every day. Just relax. Just get over yourself. So I don't know. I just noticed that and I was like, man, we're, we're going down. <laughs> With this nation, we are done. Look at verse 13. It says this, and I, whether shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. And so she is plain. She realizes at this moment that she is weak and not going to be able to stop him. And she's appealing. She's like, hey, look. She's like, Emma, look. Where am I going to cause my shame to go? I will live with this for the rest of my life. Don't you really care about me? Now, here's the thing. Don't you think that if Amnon really loved her in the biblical sense, that he would take that into consideration? Of course he would. But he doesn't because he's drunk on lust. He is intoxicated with lust. It goes into one ear and literally right out the other. Because look at verse 14 after she says that. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. And it was at this moment that he knew that he messed up. And that was going to be the original title of the sermon, but it was too long. So, and yeah. <laughs> so we're going to go with drunk on lust. And so the way this chapter breaks down is you have the pre-event, and obviously you have the main event, which is right here, and then you have everything post-event. And all of it is terrible. Okay, all of it is terrible. But like I said, there is so much that we can learn from this event. We ought to just thank God for, you know, keeping this in the Bible so that we can know what to do. Right. Because even in my short time in ministry, I've had people come to me with some crazy situations, things I couldn't even imagine. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> What am I going to tell you? What am I going to tell this person? You know, but it's stories like this and there are elements and stories like this that we can take and we can still apply to those different situations. Okay. So look at verse number 15. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, arise and be gone. Now keep your place there, but go to Titus chapter number two, Titus chapter number two. So, as the story goes, in the moment he decides to act on that lust that he has in his flesh, what happens? What does the Bible say? Like, instantly, right? All of a sudden, it's not love anymore. It's actual hate. It says, then Amnon hated her exceedingly. And I used to read this and be like, man, what the heck is going on? Like, how do you get to that point, like, where you... You love somebody or even you like them and all of a sudden you, you, you hate the person. And I'll tell you right now, it's because lust is intoxicating. That's the whole point of the story here. It, you know, at one point he did love, but when he messed up and he went to Jonadab and he spilled the beans and Jonadab gave him that advice, that was it. That cross, that, it's no longer love. He no longer loves his sister in a sisterly fashion. He no longer loves her in the inordinate affection, you know, the, the, the crazy way that he loved her from what the Bible's saying, right? It's lust is what it is. It's intoxicating lust. And you say, well, what are you trying to say here? What are you talking about? Well, what I'm trying to tell you is that when people are consumed with this kind of lust where you're vexed, I mean, you're not going to listen to counsel because he doesn't listen to her. She's making a great argument. You know, think about the future. Think about what you're about to do here. You're going to ruin my life, she says. You're going to ruin your life. We're going to be looked upon as fools in this nation for the rest of our lives doesn't even doesn't even budge next verse boom he just goes through with it that is what the bible is telling you know the bible's telling us hey this lust thing is very very powerful and it needs to be checked but what did jonadab do no he just said oh i got a little fire here <gasps> no problem i'll dump nuclear fuel on that thing and get that thing overboard so this happens what a wicked devil I mean, think about this. This is this this is why he hates her. Because guess what? When your flesh, you know, when you you you're filled to the max with lust, okay, and you actually go through with what you think is love, then guess what? When the flesh gets satisfied, the next moment you're going to be sober. You will be sober. And that's what happened here. He goes through with it and he realizes he wakes up from his drunken, you know, <laughs> he's not drunk on alcohol, but he's drunk on lust. He kind of wakes up and he realizes, wait a second, this is not what I wanted. And he instantly hates what he created. He hates the decision that he made. He hates her, but he also hates himself because he deceived her. But not only did he deceive her, he deceived himself. And you see this all the time play out in the world. 
you know, throughout my uh, my many years of working out in the workforce, you always talk about people, you know, doing the hookup, right? Oh, I'll do these hookups. Like it's no big deal. I'm just going to shack up with somebody. It's going to be good to go. You know, no problem, right? What always happens? The girl's like, oh, I thought he loved me. Or the guy, because let's, let's just be honest here. This goes both ways. It's not just a, a, a dude problem. You know, I've seen guys like, I thought she loved me. Okay, <laughs> right? You know, what happened? How could, and, and these people are left wondering, right? Like, how could this person just not talk to me anymore? Not give me a chance to process this. They're just out the door. It's because of this right here. It's because it wasn't love. And they could be pretty persuasive in the moment because these feelings and these emotions, they boil up to the top of your head and they, they just think that they love you. And so they can say things, they can manipulate you in ways to think that it's actual love, but it's not, it's lust. And when they wake up, when their flesh gets satisfied, after they go through with the act, they realize, wait a second, what did I just do? And then all of a sudden it's like, they realize I can't take this back. So the next thing to do is to just hate the person, just, just put them out of the life, just not even want to have anything to do with them. That is the state that Amnon is in right now, okay? It is very similar. You say, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with you. Well, I'm going to show you from the Bible that his actions are no different than somebody who's drunk on alcohol. Because I've seen people, you know, dr just, just drunk, do some crazy stuff. Okay, so I'm, I won't even mention it, but you know, when you work around a lot of people, you know, the military people in the world, you're going to see this type of thing. Or they just, you know, they'll get drunk and they'll just, you know, eat things that aren't food or, or, what, or whatever the case is. But this is just absolutely out of control. Okay, so Titus chapter 2, look at verse number 1. It says this, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Okay, so this is a commandment here that Paul is telling Titus, hey, speak things which become sound doctrine, right? So we need to adapt to our environment. We need to adapt to our culture. And we need to always have the word of God and measure every situation up against the word of God so that we can actively do that. And then he tells them, this is how you're going to do that. This is how you're going to become the church. This is how you're going to become the pastor. This is how you're going to become the kind of person that can actually speak sound doctrine. Look at verse 2. He says this, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. You see that word there, be sober. You know, we read that and we always think, okay, we'll just lay off the booze, right? But no, 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 it's more powerful than that. Because if you jump down to verse number six, look what he says. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, okay? And I'm going to tell you right now, obviously this applies to alcohol, this applies to marijuana, this applies to drugs, this applies to anything uh, substance-wise that would cause a person to not be sober. But it's also talking about spiritual things. It's also talking about just other things that could cause you to not think clearly, okay? So he says, young men likewise. Why does he say young men? Because young men struggle with pride. Old men struggle with pride. Everybody in here struggles with pride, but it's especially a problem with young men. And what Paul's saying here, hey, make sure you get on these young bucks. Get them to read the Bible. Get them to pray. Get them to do the right things. Make sure that they realize they're not the cream of the crop. They need to grow. They need to learn like everyone else. So he says, exhort them to be sober-minded, right? So we don't want to browbeat them. We don't want to be harsh to these people. We just want to share the truth with them. And we want to edify them. We want to help them along in this journey. Why? So that they can grow up and become a the type of person that can preach sound doctrine. So look at verse number seven. It says, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Look at this verse number eight, sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. And so all that to say this soundness comes only from being sober minded. Okay. Is that what you see with Amnon? Absolutely not. He is not hearkening. He is not listening to counsel from his own sister. She's telling him you will be destroyed. If you go through with this, what does he do? No, all he can think about is what's right in front of them. And now lives will never be the same. David will never be the same. He will never be the same. She will never be the same. He robbed from her the most important thing that she had. Because think about it during this time, it was probably gonna be pretty difficult for her to find a husband, especially back in Old Testament Israel, because everybody's gonna know about this. You could leave your place there uh, in Titus and go to Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter number 23. I mean, you, if you want another lesson on lust, just look at Saul. 
okay? We've spent a lot of time talking about King Saul because he's such a great example. But it's like, hold on, man. How could you go from loving David to wanting to actually kill him over some glory that people gave him? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's life. That happens. That's reality. That is what we have to deal with today. Okay? But what did that envy do to Saul? It drove him to do all sorts of crazy things that are just unthinkable. Do you think Saul was sober-minded? No. Was he drunk on alcohol the entire time? No. Okay. He was drunk on envy. He was drunk on lust, wanting that popularity and that status and that influence. And when he felt threatened by David's success, what happened? All hell broke loose. Now he's trying to kill. And, and to, the, to the point to where he allows Doeg the Edomite to kill the priests of God. You want to talk about intoxication, that's the perfect candidate for being intoxicated with lust or something that is not alcohol related. Okay, and just to kind of prove this further to you, Proverbs 23, look at verse number 29. It says this, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. So this chapter is giving us the dangers and the warnings of somebody who would actually go and seek alcoholic beverages, this mixed wine, this strong, corruptible drink. Look at verse 31. It says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. You say, well, what does that mean? How does it move itself? Well, if you know anything about the fermentation process and you look at something that's been fermenting, what does it do? It bubbles up, it moves. Okay. So that's what the, what, uh, Solomon's telling us here, hey, you know, don't lust after that. Don't let that hoodwink you into thinking that that's going to solve your problems, that that's going to, you know, um, aid you in any kind of way. Look at verse 32. It says this, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thy heart shall utter perverse things. And this is the result of somebody who's going to get on this mixed wine here. Okay. But isn't that what we've seen with Amnon? I mean, think about it. Jonadab's advice that he took, what did that wind up doing? It bit him like a serpent, right? Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Everybody in here agrees that lusting after your half-sister is definitely beholding strange women, okay? And thine heart shall utter perverse things. What was his heart uttering? Go through with it. Do it. It's good for you. It's okay. Don't listen to her. Just do it. Look at verse uh, number 34. Yea, thou shalt be... As he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Now, these are two things that are just absolutely unthinkable. Anybody who is sober is not going to be like, you know what, I'm going to go take a nap in the middle of the lake over here or in the middle of the ocean, right? That sounds like a good idea. It'd be like a waterbed, you know, and I'll be just fine. Or I'm going to go up and lay on top of a mast on a ship. You know, is that a good idea? No. You know, if you weren't on that, you wouldn't do something like that. Okay, it's the same thing with Amnon, right? Ruining your own flesh and blood's life like that. That is not somebody that is sober. So the, all that to say this too, you know, it's not just the alcohol that can intoxicate us. Look at verse 35. They have stricken me. They shall, uh, it says, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And so what is this saying here? They won't hearken unto counsel. They won't listen to anything. They're just going to go and seek that same feeling, that same high over and over and over again. That is what we are dealing with here. So go back to 2 Samuel chapter number 13 and we'll move on. And so again, you know, if, when you take the symptoms, you take the signs of somebody who's on something like this, somebody who is not sober, somebody who's drunk, it's really the same thing as Amnon. He's not listening to counsel. He won't listen to reason. He, you know, he's, he's doing something that's absolutely unthinkable, which only has the consequences of total destruction, an absolute nightmare. And he goes through with it. So that's why I say, hey, you know what? Lust is intoxicating. And that's why I titled the sermon, Drunk on Lust. Look at verse number 16. And she said unto him, there is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. So again, he's not listening to anything. It's his way or the highway. Verse 17, then he called his servant and, or, that ministered unto him and said, put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. 
I mean, okay, so let's stop for a second here. So not only did he violate her, but he's also devaluing her. I mean, you want to talk about adding insult to injury? This is it right here. He's giving her no time to even get her thoughts together, to get stuff ready, to maybe come up with a plan to even, as sick as it sounds, to, to, to cover it up, to, you know, maybe protect her shame from the people. You know, none of that. Just get her out of here. Just, just, you just need to leave right now. I can't stand your sight. Where before, he couldn't stand not to even think about her. Verse number 18. And she had a garment of diverse colors upon her, for with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparel. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. Now it's kind of kind of interesting here to notice when you read about the uh, the sons of the kings how they have servants. You know, you know. So when you get that snooty little rich kid out, you know, so when you say you're not that rich, you don't have servants. You're, you're nothing here. I'm just teasing. <laughs> We need to get some servants. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Look at verse 19. It says, And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garment of diverse colors that was on her and laid her hand upon her head and went on crying. Now, this here has always been interesting to me what happens next. So you see the state that she's in. She's devastated. She's been violated. She's been devalued. She's had no time to get anything together. She tears her garment, which we've talked about this before. That is a great sign of distress. So anybody would look at her and be like, uh-oh, why does she tear that garment, which is supposed to signify pureness? We have a problem here. Well, she runs into her real brother, her full brother. Look at this, verse number 20. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Hath Amnon thy brother been with thee? But hold now thy peace, my sister. He is thy brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. My question has always been, why was Amnon the first person that came to the mind of Absalom? Think about that for a second. You know, it, the Bible says that she was fair, that she was a beautiful girl. Okay, so what can we learn from that? Well, there was probably a lot of people that thought that about her. I'm sure he wasn't the first person to try something, you know, or, or to, to let her know that she looked good. But Absalom sees her and he's like, everything just clicks. Has Amnon, thy brother, been with thee? And here's the point. Again, you don't just go from zero to 100 that quickly, okay? There are signs. There are symptoms. This dude has a sickness. He's intoxicated. When someone's drunk or in the, even in the process of getting drunk, there are always signs. There are always symptoms, right? Slurred speech. There's the smell. There's just, you know, things not clicking, the redness of the eyes, all these different types of things. It's the same thing when someone's drunk on lust. There are symptoms, which means what? There are signs, which means what? People can, if you have the discernment, you can pick up on those things and protect yourself, okay? But Absalom doesn't do that. He puts two and two together. He knows what the answer is going to be because he knows his brother. He's probably seen him out. He's probably, I don't know if he heard conversation. The Bible doesn't tell us, but somehow Amnon was number one on his mind when he saw what had happened to his sister. And so that tells us that Amnon was definitely giving up signs. And here's the other thing, you know, a lot of times when people in our own families, right, are displaying signs, we tend to overlook it. You know, why is your uncle always around these boys? Why, you know, why is he always trying to mentor kids? Oh, no, he doesn't mean any harm by it. Right, because it could never happen to you. You could never have a sodomite in your family. You could never have something wrong in your family. Right, we ought not to be like that. It's the same thing in a church setting. Right, it's the same thing in the family of God. In a church setting, you know, people just have this idea sometimes, like, well, if they, if they come through those doors, well, they got to be good people. And you've seen in the past, right, Storm Morton. Right, Storm Morton had a sickness, and it's called being a reprobate. What were her symptoms? Questioning the Word of God after everyone left. Symptom number two, paying extreme attention to the children, to the point to where I think when he first met Uriah, he's just like, you know, like pat him on the head and stuff. You know, when I first met Uriah, he's like, get out of here. I'm like, all right, cool, no problem, man. <laughs> I had to earn their trust, you know what I mean? But you get what I'm trying to say here. Where there's a sickness, there are symptoms. Where there are symptoms, there are signs. And look what else we read after that. What, look what he does here. But hold now thy peace, my sister. Don't tell anyone. Just keep this quiet. He is thy brother. <sighs> oh, thanks for letting me know that. What does him being your family member have to do with the rape? Nothing. 
This should have been brought up. Something should have been done. Absalom should have said, you know what? I'm going to protect you and we're going to do something about this. But he doesn't. He said, he is thy brother. Regard not this thing. What does that mean? Don't even think about it. It's not a big deal. Not a big deal. What are you talking about? You just robbed this woman. So not only has she been violated by her own half-brother, devalued by her own half-brother, but now by her full brother, she's being devalued, ignored. And this is what happens in our society. This is what we do. This is, I'm, I'm talking like as a nation. People want to cover stuff like this up. Hey, don't tell anybody. It's going to make our family look bad. And, you know, we want to protect this. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be here for you. You know, we'll talk about it, but just don't, don't go to the police, blah, 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 because it's a family member. That's wrong. You're setting, when, when this happens in a home and this happens to people, you're setting these people to be passive aggressive and to possibly blame everything on God. Right. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to somebody who's gone through something similar to this and they hate God. They blame God for it. Where was God? Right? This is, this is, this is becoming a holdabout there during soul winning. You know, you tell them it's a free gift. You don't have to do anything for it. You're telling me you could be a child molester? That seems to be happening a lot. You know what that tells me? That's becoming a big, big, big thing in our society where you're going to see this a lot more. You're going to talk to somebody and they're going to be like, are you telling me that a child must be saved? No, we don't tell you that. Well, that's what the church down the street might tell you, but that's not what we're going to tell you. We're actually going to tell you the truth. We're going to tell you what the Bible really says right. so that you can properly heal. Amen. Did she properly heal? Well, it says that she remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Now, obviously, Absalom dies later on. We don't know what happens to her. We don't know, but it definitely wasn't good. Look at verse 21. It says this, but when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. So here we go. You know, her dad finds out about this and he's wroth. He is extremely upset. He is extremely angry. Verse 22, and Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. <clears throat> so what do we have right now? What's going on? David's mad. He just found out about it. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, look at verse 23. And it came to pass after two full years. That's what happened. Two full years passed. Nothing. Right? So at all this time, this two years, you know, Absalom's probably within himself thinking like, you know, we need to get Leviticus up. You know, you know, he needs to die for this. He needs to be punished. And I preached about this the last time I went to Vancouver. I preached a sermon called The Disease to Please. So I get a lot more into detail about that um, if, you, if you're interested. But look at the rest of the verse. It says, And it came to pass after two full years, Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Hazor, which is beside Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. Absalom's smart. He's kind of got a little subtlety to him as well, right? Because he's just quiet. He doesn't speak good. He doesn't speak bad to Amnon. He just, he's playing his cards right. But inside, he wants that revenge. He wants to do something to his half-brother. Look at verse 24. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, thy servant hath sheep shears. Let the king, I beseech thee, and his servants go with thy servant. And the king said unto Absalom, Nay, my son, let us not all now go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him how be it he would not go, but blessed him. So David's like, hey, look, we don't want to owe you nothing here. Okay, I understand you want to have a good time, so just go. I'll bless you. Maybe I'll send you with something. We're not sure. Look at verse 26. Then said Absalom, if not, I pray thee, let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said unto him, why should he go with thee? So here you see David, like, kind of having a little bit of a moment here. He's like, wait a second, right? Mm, this isn't lining up. Like, you haven't really said good or bad towards your brother. I doubt you've gotten over it, but I'm not sure, you know, but guess what's not coming to his mind? The prophecy, which Nathan told him in chapter number 11, that the sword would never depart from thine house. Okay. And we've talked about that extensively as well in the past. So we don't have time for it tonight, but look at verse 27, but Absalom pressed him that he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. You know, David, as a parent, was a pushover. You know, you could drop him off in Rabbah to the, the children of Ammon, and he'd be like, everyone dies. I, he's like, I know my fathers. You know, they spared some. He's like, here, everyone dies. Not only are they all going to die, but we're going to cut them with sauce. <laughs> we're going to put them under harrows of iron. We're going to do this in style, okay? <laughs> That's how David was. But when it came to the kids, he's like, ah, you, you, know, you got them chubby cheeks and stuff. I, 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 just, you know, I just can't say no to you, right? And he never outgrew that. Look at verse 28. 
And now Absalom had commanded his servant, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say unto you, smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not. Have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. So again, to answer the question, what happens after David is wroth? Two full years and, and Absalom concocts his plan and now he's going to kill his own brother. Look at verse 29. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose and every man got him up upon his mule and fled. And it came to pass while they were in the way that tidings came to David saying, Absalom hath slain all the king's sons and there is not one left. So David gets news, okay? David just gets news here and that news is false obviously because we just read the story, but this news is false. This news says, hey, all your sons are dead. Look at verse 31. Then the king arose and tear his garments and lay on the earth and all his servants stood by with their clothes rent. Now, remember how I mentioned the subtlety of Jonadab in the beginning of the chapter. This is important here. Look at verse 32. And Jonadab, so Jonadab's here, right? Isn't that convenient? He's always at the right place at the wrong time. It says, And Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my lord suppose that they have slain all the young men the king sent, for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this hath been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Now, it's kind of interesting here that Jonadab, again, being a subtle man, knew that that, that, that tidings, that news wasn't true. And you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, you, hear, you have to learn something about people that are subtle. They pay attention more than you think. They are crafty. They are watching your moves. They watch how you react. They're good at throwing jabs, you know, and seeing how you react. You know, they, they get your balance figured out. And then that's when they move in to carry out their will. Because think about this. At this time, David's not like, oh, you know, you're a garbage friend. He has no idea that Jonah Dab set Amnon up for it. Yep. Right? But what do we see here? Jonadab perceives that that news is false because he had been paying attention to this situation since it happened. Look at verse 33. Now, therefore, let not my lord, the king, take the thing to his heart to think that all the king's sons are dead for Amnon only is dead. And so you got to be careful when you're at work and you got that subtle guy, right? And he's doing his subtle activities and you've got him spotted. You know, he's a Jonadab. You need to know he's watching you. He's watching or she's watching you. They are watching you to see what you do, how you act, how you do business so that they can get you should the occasion arise. Verse 34, but Absalom fled and the young man that kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there came much people by the way of the hillside behind him. So now he's going to find out that what Jonadab told him is true. And again, what kind of friend is Jonadab here? He's literally throwing his dead so-called friend now under the bus after the dude's dead. So that just adds into the wickedness that this guy Jonadab really is. Verse 35, and Jonadab said unto the king, behold, the king's sons are come as thy servant said, so it is. So he's like, see, you can trust me, David. I'm right. You know, I told you this was false news. This is fake news, right? This is fake news. But all the while, it's because he's in this a lot deeper <laughs> than he's letting on. You know, and I mean, I guess right here, you could take this passage and preach a whole story against fake news. I think I did that not too long ago, but I don't have time tonight. <sighs> CNN is all through this, okay? And so is Fox and a lot of the others. But look at verse 36. It says, And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of speaking, and thank God, because he's an idiot, that behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept, and the king also and all his servants wept very sore. Verse 37, so now David knows. Okay, yeah, Jonah Dab was right. Good job, buddy. But Absalom fled. Verse 37, but Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihad, king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. Verse 38, so Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. So during this time now, this is what, five years removed from when... Uh, the event happened to Tamar and Amnon decided to go through with this. And you can kind of see that David's attitude here is shifting towards Absalom. Look at verse 39, last verse in the chapter. It says, And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. So it's like David is starting to now make peace with what happened. You know, I don't know if he was like, well, 
You know, this is kind of what he had coming to him. But it would be devastating, you know. This is a, but this is the consequences that David brought on himself when he decided to cut a hedge and his hedge of protection that God originally placed on him. This is what's happening now, okay. Remember, God said, I'm putting away your sin, but the sword will never depart from your house. So when his children needed that protection, it wasn't there. Right? And we're not going to say, oh, God made them do this. This is because God made this happen. No, God didn't make this happen. Right. It's just the sword's not there. You know, David did a, a, a wicked thing. And obviously, you know, Amnon's, you know, <laughs> extremely wicked. But you say, okay, that's a pretty intense chapter. But there's a lot to learn there. And obviously the biggest one are the symptoms, you know, to realize. Well, first of all, it's not just alcohol that makes people drunk makes people do stupid things. It could be lust and that lust could be over a, another person or it could be lusting over power. I mean, I mean, that's what our rich folks today and right. the world are guilty of, right? They, I mean, Bill Gates is a good example of this. I mean, he is drunk on lust. He wants power, wants to murder, you know what? 500 million people off the planet. <laughs> Says he's gonna do it through vaccines, thinks that's a good idea. And the, the masses are like, yes, Billy, yes, Billy. Right, oh, yeah, this is great. And while we got like, I don't know, a good couple handfuls of people here tonight, we're like, that dude's a devil. <laughs> right? But we're the minority. The minority. And that's because that lust, that covetousness, that's what's being sown into our culture today. Right. It dumbs people down. See, it's not just the fake news' fault, right? That's not it. It's also lusting after materialistic goods. I mean, that's, you know, giving, oh, we'll give you a paycheck. We'll give you a stimulus, man. You don't got to go to work. You can just chill out, right? Let's defund the cops so you can get away with even more crime. Let's give them free drugs. Let's just pump them with all this stuff. You know, it's like our government's ran by Jonah Dab Biden, you know? <laughs> I, think just, I think Jonah Dab's ancestors are actually running the government. That's what I think, but I can't prove that. So <laughs> we'll bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you again, Lord, so much uh, just for preserving these hard core truths in the Bible. And I just pray you to help us to, to learn these things uh, that happened in the Bible so that we can avoid them ourselves, Lord. And we thank you for this great wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.